Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. It's Steve with another episode of Astronomy Daily. It is the 25th of March 2024. Astronomy Daily, the podcast with your host, Steve Dunkley. Oh, and we're straight into it for another episode of Astronomy Daily. Thanks for joining us again on this perfect, perfect day. Look, I don't want to brag or anything, but down here in Australia, we have got the best of everything. Did I mention that we've got the best of everything? Despite the fact that everything here can kill you, they balance <laughs> they balance it by giving us the best of everything. The best beaches, the best mountains, the best lakes, the best rivers, the best weather. When the weather doesn't try and kill you as well, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Anyway, today was fantastic. That's what I'm getting at. It's just stunning in every possible way. But anyway... Uh, today we've got a couple of really amazing stories for you, something very helpful for sky watchers in the Northern Hemisphere. There's a big event, as you know, coming up, and we've got an update from the DART mission. Uh, that's the one that, uh, as you know... Um... The one that collided with the asteroid. Oh, here she is, Hallie. That's exactly the one I'm talking about. And it looks like they've got some very surprising results there. And what else? Well, you remember the Euclid mission? That's the one making a 3D map of the universe. On the ball as usual, Hallie, that's exactly the mission we're talking about. They launched it to make a 3D map of the universe. That's a pretty big mission. So what's up? Well, Hallie, ice is the problem, and we'll find out how they deal with ice uh, from back here on Earth. It's pretty clever and pretty simple. Clever and simple. Sounds like someone I know. Oh, uh, uh, thanks, Hallie, I think. Anyway, they're working on a solution that is indeed clever and simple. As all good solutions are. True enough, then. And what have you got for us, Hallie? I'm looking at cancer research in space. Oh, that's great. Like, I was talking to some people uh, this week about astronauts and uh, the ISS and the research that goes on. They were, they were saying, what, what do those astronauts do on the ISS? This might answer some of those questions. And it's real-world changing research, too. Also, very soon, there will be a massive eclipse spanning the United States, all the way from Mexico to northeast Canada. Oh, yes, millions will see that uh, all across the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, even though we won't be able to see it on our side of the world, take notes, flat earthers. Yes. You're funny, Steve, but my story is for all you sky watchers to be safe eclipse watchers. Ah, uh, yes, that's right. Just because it's an eclipse doesn't mean it can't damage your eyesight for good. Right. So on with the show. She's all business today, everybody. It's all yours, Hallie. Here we go. Experiments in the weightless environment of space have led to crazy progress in the fight against cancer, NASA officials said. Space is a unique place for research, astronaut Frank Rubio said at the event in Washington. The 48-year-old, a physician and former military helicopter pilot, conducted cancer research during his recent mission to the International Space Station, orbiting some 400 kilometers, 250 miles, above the Earth's surface. Not only do cells their age more rapidly, speeding up research, their structures are also described as pure. They all don't clump together, as they do, on Earth because of gravity. They are suspended in space, enabling better analysis of their molecular structures, said NASA Chief Bill Nelson. Research conducted in space can help make cancer drugs more effective, Nelson added. Pharmaceutical giant Merck has conducted research on a ISS with Keytruda, an anti-cancer drug that patients now receive intravenously. Its key ingredient is difficult to transform into a liquid. One solution is crystallization, a process often used in drug manufacturing. In 2017, Merck conducted experiments to see if the crystals would form more rapidly in space than on Earth. Thanks to such research, researchers will be able to make a drug that can be administered by injection in a doctor's office instead of through long and painful chemotherapy treatments, he added. A solar eclipse will be visible across North America on April 8. Everyone in the U.S. will see at least a partial solar eclipse, but only those within the 115-mile-wide, 185-kilometers path of totality will witness the sun's face completely blocked by the moon's shadow for up to 4 minutes, 28 seconds. Only during totality, when the sun's face is completely blocked, is it safe to look at the totally eclipsed sun's corona with the naked eye. 
At all other times, including during the partial phase of the eclipse, you must wear certified solar eclipse glasses to view the sun. There are some safety issues to be aware of at other times too. Here are six tips to ensure a safe and enjoyable viewing of the solar eclipse. Number 1. Don't ever use ordinary sunglasses to protect your eyes. They won't help one bit. Even filters that are meant for goggles, cameras, telescopes and binoculars are useless to protect your eyes. Tip 2. Know when to use only approved eclipse safety glasses. Solar eclipse glasses must be used to look at the sun, only during the brief moment of totality when the moon fully obscures the sun can you remove them. Tip number 3. Be prepared to travel. Although the path of totality on April 8 will include several major cities and metropolitan areas, it crosses a lot of backcountry. Many people will chase clear skies, which could take them to areas they hadn't planned on visiting. Remote parts of Texas, Arkansas, Missouri, New York, Vermont, New Hampshire and Maine, in particular, are short on facilities and gas stations. So bring everything you need, including a full fuel tank and extra food, water, cash and toilet paper. Number 4. It might seem obvious but pay attention to the weather. In April, you can expect the unexpected, with everything from snow in the northeast to tornadoes in the Midwest. In remote areas of the northeastern U.S. and Canada, the mountains, lakes and forests may provide a beautiful backdrop but conditions in the backcountry that time of year can be difficult. Number 5. Be careful in the cities. If you decide to watch the eclipse from a city sidewalk, perhaps even during a lunch break at work, then watch out. Wandering into roads and other dangerous situations is easier than you might think when you're looking through solar eclipse glasses. The best, easiest and safest eclipse observing site is an open space or park, which will likely have a much better view of the eclipse than city streets, where buildings could easily block the view. The biggest cities inside the path are Mazatlan and Torian, Mexico, San Antonio, Austin and Dallas, Texas, Indianapolis, Indiana, Hamilton, Ontario, Montreal, Quebec. Number 6. And you're probably getting the picture by now, an eclipse this big can be a pretty big hazard for the unwary and the unprepared. So in the cities, be careful. Don't blindly walk out onto roads and always be aware of your surroundings. Relocating at the last minute in search of clear weather is not particularly recommended unless the roads are clear and you have multiple backup plans. A great way to begin your research is to use an interactive eclipse map and note the eclipse schedules for various locations in advance. A great option is to download the Solar Eclipse Timer app, which provides audio commentary on exactly what to expect and when to expect it and instantly tells you if you're inside the path of totality. So enjoy the eclipse and stay safe. Back to you, favorite human. Oh, well, thank you for sticking with us, everybody. And don't forget to visit our new URL to check out all the back editions of Astronomy Daily. Of course, we've made it very easy now. Just go to astronomydaily.io. Uh, that's astronomydaily.io. And if you'd like to receive the now famous Astronomy Daily newsletter in your email each day, just like Hallie and I do, pop your email address into the slot provided. And don't forget, you can still visit us on the Space Nuts podcast group page. That's a bit of a mouthful, I know, uh, on Facebook and on our new X page. That's uh, formerly Twitter. Now we're going to keep saying that, don't we? X formerly Twitter. And uh, the address there is uh, at Astro Daily Pod. Uh, it sounds like something out of uh, 2001, doesn't it? At Astro Daily Pod. And as they say in the funny pages, Bob's your uncle. Bob, he's not really. Unless you actually have an uncle called Bob or Robert. That's very confusing. Have the boffins been up here messing with your literal circuits again, Hallie? It, it, it's just a saying, Hallie. Why would everyone have an uncle with the same name? How could that even be possible? It's not, Hallie. No. Um, no, no. Um, just play the promo, Hallie, please. Well, it may come as no surprise that it's very cold in space. 
And those of you who have been following the travels of Euclid, a uh, probe sent out to uh, map the universe, you will probably be assuming uh, that uh, some of its sensors may be uh, reacting to the cold. And that's exactly what's happening as ice is starting to cloud Euclid's optics on uh, July 1st, 2023, the European Space Agency launched the Euclid Observatory, a mission that will spend the next six years investigating the composition and evolution of the universe. In particular, Euclid will observe how the universe has expanded over the last 10 mil billion years to test theories about dark energy. I know I've had a bit of dark energy lately. You'll have to forgive me for that. While fine-tuning, the cal calibrating the... Uh, telescopes instruments in preparation for the mission's first survey the mission team noticed that a few layers of water ice formed on its mirrors after entering in the freeze freezing cold of space while common this is a problem for highly sensitive missions like Euclid which requires remarkable precision to investigate cosmic expansion after months of research, the Euclid team tested a newly designed procedure to de-ice the mission's optics. On March 20th, the ESA announced that the team's de-icing approach worked so far, and that Euclid's vision had been restored. If the method proves successful, it will have validated the mission team's plan to keep Euclid's optical system working for the rest of the mission. It was always expected that there would be some water contamination with Euclid, which is why there was an outgassing campaign shortly after launch. This consisted of the telescope being warmed up by onboard heaters and also partially exposed to the sun, sublimating most of the water brought from Earth. However, a considerable amount remained after being absorbed in the telescope's multi-layer insulation, which slowly began building up on the VIS instrument's mirror surfaces. After months of research, lab studies and calibrations, the team determined the source and began working on a solution. The obvious solution was to heat Euclid again by running all its internal heaters for days. However, this ran risk of deforming the mechanical structure of the spacecraft, which could alter Euclid's optical alignment, said Andreas Randolph, who is Euclid's flight director at ESA's Mission Control. The team began by individually heating two of Euclid's mirrors independently, a low-risk approach since they are located in areas where water vapour was not likely to contaminate other instruments. However, the response to this problem highlights the international cooperation that made this mission possible, said Ralph Coley, Euclid's instrument operations scientist. In addition, this issue could lead to vital research on how to maintain missions where highly sensitive optics are concerned. Despite how common this issue is for spacecraft, there is very little research on how ice forms on optical mirrors and impacts observations. The solution devised by the mission team and agency could lead to new procedures for future missions. These could come in handy when Euclid is joined by NASA's Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope in March 2027, another mission that will explore the dark universe. Astronomy Derby with Steve and Halley. Space, space science and astronomy. Hey, remember that time we uh, rammed a, a space probe into a, a, an asteroid to take revenge for the destruction of the dinosaurs? Was, was that what it was all about? No? No? Anyway, yeah, that was the old DART mission. Not the old DART mission, but it was only two years ago. On September 26, 2022, NASA's double asteroid redirection test, DART, wasn't a great name, spacecraft slammed into the side of a 170-metre-wide asteroid Dimorphos to test the future asteroid deflection tactics in the event of an asteroid that might be threatening Earth. Following the impact, uh, DART teams confirmed that the spacecraft's collision with the asteroid had successfully deflected the asteroid. Actually, I think I got my wires crossed. That's not the one that fired the bullet into the uh, asteroid. That was the Japanese Hayabusa mission. Got my wires crossed. Following the impact, DART teams confirmed that the spacecraft's collision with the asteroid had successfully deflected the asteroid by a small amount, proving the design of the deflector uh, and allowing scientists and engineers to better understand the ways we can protect Earth from asteroids. However, a new study from a group of scientists shows that DART's collision with Dimorphos not only changed the shape of its orbit around the host uh, asteroid Didymus, but also significantly changed the shape of the asteroid itself. 
Before the collision, Dimorphos was known to be a roughly symmetrical oblate spheroid. Now, I know a few fellas like that. Shaped asteroid similar to a squished ball. Oh, sorry, fellas. That is wider than it is tall. Oh, it's getting worse, isn't it? Additionally, it took the asteroid around 11 hours and 55 minutes, you could say almost 12 hours, <laughs> to complete one orbit around Didymus, which, as mentioned, had been altered uh, following DART's impact with Didym uh, Dimorphos. When DART made impact, things got very interesting. Dimorphos orbit no longer it was no longer circular and its uh, orbital period is now 33 minutes and 15 seconds shorter and the entire shape of the asteroid has changed from relatively symmetrical um, to a triaxial triaxial ellipsoid something more like an oblong watermelon uh, said navigation engineer Shantanu Naidu of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, in Ca uh, California. The DSN Goldstone Solar uh, uh, System Radar was now second data source, which is located in Barstow, California, using DART's impact sequence. Uh, the Goldstone radar bounced radio waves off Dimorphos and Didymus to measure the position and velocity of Dimorphos and Didymus precisely before and after Dart's collision. These measurements are uh, what allowed NASA's team to quickly discern whether or not Dart, Dart's impact had indeed deflected Dimorphos in its orbit around Didymus. Teams would eventually find that the effect of Dart's impact on the asteroid greatly exceeded the minimum expectations for the mission. Final, uh, the final and most significant data source utilised in uh, Nadu et al.'s uh, study was ground telescopes located around Earth that measured the light curve, how sunlight reflects on the surface of the asteroids over time from both asteroids. Comparing the asteroids' light curves before and after impact allowed the team to determine more about how DART had altered Dimorphos' position around Didymus. We used the timing of this precise series of light curve dips to deduce the shape of the orbit and because our models were so sensitive, we could figure also out the shape of the asteroid before impact. Chesley continued, the times of the events occurred regularly allowing the circular orbit. Following the impact, there were very slight timing differences showing something was askew. We never expected to get this kind of accuracy, said co-author Steve Chesley at JPL. Naidu even confirmed that their models were so sensitive that they were able to detect a slight back and forth rocking of Dimorphos as, it's, as it orbits around Didymus. What's more, Naidu et al's models were also able to calculate how Dimorphos' orbital period around Didymus was altered and evolved over time. Immediately following impact, teams found that DART had reduced Dimorphos' orbital period by 32 minutes and 42 seconds, making its total orbital period around Didymus 11 hours, 22 minutes and 33 seconds. However, the asteroid's or orbit would continue to shorten as the asteroid continually lost more and more surface material from the impact to space. Dimorphos' orbital period would finally settle to be approximately 11 hours, 22 minutes and 3 whole seconds, meaning that DART's impact officially altered the orbit of the asteroid by 33 minutes and 15 seconds. The scientists' calculations are accurate to within 1.5 seconds and Dart's impact now sits at the a The results of this study uh, agree with the others from that are being published. Of 1, Seeing separate groups meters, analyze the data and independently come to the same conclusions is a hallmark of solid scientific result. Dart is not only showing us the pathway to an asteroid deflection technology, it is revealing new fundamental understanding of what asteroids are and how they behave, said NASA's lead scientist for solar systems small bodies Tom Statler of NASA's HQ in Washington, D.C. The results from Nadu et al's study, along with uh, observations of material left around Dimorphos after the impact, indicate that uh, Dimorphos is a loosely packed rubble pile asteroid similar to asteroid Bennu that was visited and sampled by NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission. The European Space Agency's upcoming HERA mission will travel back out to Didymus Dimorphos system to further investigate the long-term changes made to Dimorphos by DART's impact. And that's it for another episode of Astronomy Daily featuring me, Flesh and Blood Steve, and my digital pal who's fun to be with, Hallie. I am fun to be with. I'm going to have to check your batteries, Hallie. 
I liked that story about the DART mission. I know you love asteroid stories too. Yes, they are my favourites. I know I keep saying that, which reminds me, Hallie, I saw a great story about drilling for water on Mars, which I wanted to get to today, but I ran out of time. So, folks, go and check it out on the Astronomy Daily newsletter. It's a terrific story, and it'll get your imagination whirring just like mine. I've read it. Great stuff. So that's it for another day. I guess I'll see you next week, Hallie. Unless I see you first. For sure. Bye, Hallie. Bye, everyone. Bye. Astronomy Daily, the podcast. With your host, Steve Dunkley.